Welcome. I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of Pack TV, and today we're hosting a COVID-19 update for the town of Pembroke. We're hosting these each day on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 o'clock in the morning, so you can get an update on what's going on in Pembroke. Um, we can be, this can be viewed on Pembroke Comcast Channel 15, and if you go to packtv.org slash live, you can watch it on our internet, um, on our, excuse me, on our streaming channel. Um, the, if you have questions that you want to ask during the forum, please email them to pembrokeinfo at packtv.org. And for the forum replay schedule and additional Pembroke meeting coverage, visit packtv.org slash Pembroke. Sabrina Chilcott, who's Pembroke's Assistant Town Manager, is going to moderate the forum and will introduce the participants that are contributing today. Welcome, Sabrina. Thank you very much, Julie. Good morning to you. Today, we have some of our the regular members who were on in, in the recent Tuesdays, plus a few new ones as well. Um, we have the Pembroke Housing Authority's Executive Director, John McEwen, with us today. Hi. We have Council and Aging Director, Gretchen Emmett, School Superintendent, Aaron Obi. Cheryl Larson from the Pembroke Public School System and Representative Josh Cutler with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. John, as the newest member, you're going first and you're coming in, uh, coming in telling us more about the Housing Authority. And who, who do you serve in Pembroke? Well, Sabrina, I think a lot of people don't realize what it is what we do. We house literally hundreds of Pembroke's residents, and they are elderly, they are disabled, they are veterans and families. And in addition, part of the portfolio, we have two group homes that uh, do great work for people with uh, various needs. And, um, you know, it's, it's great work and it's uh, very rewarding, but uh, during these times, it's a lot to do. All right, so how are the residents doing right now, John? Uh, you know something, Sabrina, I think that uh, when you think about the America's greatest generation, World War II, we have a lot of survivors here that uh, veterans had served. And then that generation that was born of them um, are very resilient and hardy stock. They're um, very disciplined. So the residents, they, they know what to do when given some direction or some assistance or instruction. They're following it to the letter. Um, currently, I, I think that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do and need to do to weather this storm. Um, and a lot of it has to do with who they are as people. Um, sure. It's really making my job a lot easier. That's really good news. Yeah. Gretchen, Gretchen, you're getting some feedback from the seniors. You're on the phones every day with them. Um, how are the seniors tending to hold up? How are they reporting into you at the Council on Aging? So they're calling in on a regular basis. They seem to be a little bit nervous as, you know, this is all seems to be ramping up. Um, and they, you know, they're worried about grocery shopping. So we're going to this week roll out our plan for going grocery shopping, which is, isn't as easy as it think, you think because we have volunteers, but... We have to have financial transaction release reports and things like that. So um, we're all in a process right now of uh, really uh, staying on it 24 hours a day to see what we can do to help. Okay, thank you. Um, so the most recent change that we've been witnessing on social media is the change to educational offerings. Getting a lot of uh, social media sharing of parents in the trenches with their kids, Ms. Obi. Can you tell us a little bit about how the educational programming has changed in the last week or two? Sure, so yesterday we started um, our new platform of remote learning. So instead of the enrichment activities um, and assignments that teachers had been sharing with families up until Friday of last week, this week we shifted to actual schoolwork. Um, again, it's not, it's not an exchange for a school day, but it is a, more of an attempt of a structured day for students um, with expectations around assignments and handing in those assignments and being in communication um, with their with, um, their teachers and asking questions and really, you know, trying to simulate as much of a, a learning process as we can virtually. Um, I, I have two students at home and homeschooling yesterday was definitely more difficult than it had been in previous weeks. But again, you know, we're adjusting as on the fly as we can. Um, I think the statement 
last week was that we're building the plane while we fly it. So um, teachers have been amazing. All the staff has been amazing. Um, our number one focus has been and continues to be the mental health of our students, um, the social emotional supports that we can provide for them. Because as kids, this is this is scary. Um, so I am fortunate to have found a lovely social worker, Cheryl Larson, that was willing to join us today um, to kind of answer some of those type of questions that families are experiencing, as well as offer some of the resources and supports that we have in place for our students. So Cheryl, can you please tell us some of the things that you not only are hearing back about how parents and students are adjusting, but uh, what your observations have been as you process some of that information? Well, I think it, it's really important to remember that we truly are all in this together. Many of our teachers are also parents who are trying to do the remote learning thing at the same time, myself included. So we truly understand the struggle of the technology, the demands. Um, and we've shifted in the schools from just purely teaching to really coaching and consulting with families because um, the outreach, the connection is so important. Um, we're hearing from families that they're a little overwhelmed by all the different technology needs, um, not so sure how to get their kids to do the work. Um, and But they're also balancing kids who are having a hard time with their emotions. So one of the things we're really hoping and stressing to families is to take care of themselves. Um, one way to do that is to set a routine every day, even if it's a simple wake up time and bedtime that you can keep the same structure, predictability that really helps kids preschool to high school. We're also wanting you to connect socially because you can't physically be close. Please reach out to family and friends through texting and FaceTime. It helps make you feel more normal. I think it's important that families hear that this is a hard time. It's not a extended vacation. We're all feeling stressed out and that's okay. Um, and lastly, please reach out to your teachers or your counselors in your building. If you're feeling confused or overwhelmed, if you have questions, we have lots of um, resources for you, or, you know, we can just listen and help you guide through a really tough day. Um, but that's, that's kind of the main message we're trying to send out to families right now. Understood. Um, quick question as a follow-up, Cheryl. Um, so you've got folks learning new technology. You have them all in the same house. You have them in close quarters. Um, what are some of the things that they can do that are safe and productive and together, but together and apart? I mean, do you have examples of ways that they can actually do some of these things? And by the way, that's even for the parents. You know, some of the adults, too, are really looking to connect. Right, right. So I think um, for families, I think making that routine, but also finding that time to get outside every day because the just the fresh air, even if it's a terrible, rainy March, April day, a walk to the mailbox, five deep breaths and a walk back can sometimes help um, I think that families, what I'm hearing, that there's lots of movie nights going on. There might be some board games that are happening. And it's really about being flexible with the expectations. Dinner doesn't have to happen around the table every night. Um, peanut butter and jelly is okay for breakfast. It's being flexible and adapting to how everybody's doing in the moment. It's funny, they, you know, the big lives became a little bit smaller and a little, you know, and, and trying to make them so uh, powerful, you know, can be such a strain after two weeks and knowing there's two more and then two more. Right. For that, that's right. Not one. Um, I do have a question for the state representative. Representative Cutler, you're with us today. How are you? Good morning, Sabrina. Good Thank morning. you. So you've got Pembroke and you are our rep and you are listening to us and you're working with us. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're hearing in some of the other communities as a barometer, just to give us some perspective 
I mean, we're Pembroke all the time and you get to see other communities. What is the broad um, takeaway that you have when you get out and or virtually get out and uh, talk with everyone? Uh, yes, well, great question. And, and you know, obviously, we're Pembroke special and unique. But I have to say that you know the concerns that I hear in Pembroke are very similar to what I hear in my other communities as well. Um, I think the town is doing a great job uh, at the local level of handling all this, and all of you are doing a great job, including folks who are here and also some who aren't here. Um, and uh, but the concerns that I hear from residents are the same. Uh, most of the the feedback we're getting lately has to do with um, you know just qualifying for benefits, unemployment insurance. Those are some of the main concerns. I hope we will touch on that in a little bit. Um, and I hear that from all of my communities. So really, you know, we are all in this together. I know others have said that, and uh, that's reflective of the concerns that I hear from folks. It's funny. One of the takeaways that we had um, and that we brought back to the, the emergency management team after the last session with you on Tuesday of last week was the expanded page of offerings for unemployment and small businesses. And as a result, we took the Pembroke Town website and did some work on that to expound and expand on it based on your recommendation. And quite frankly, we did, in fact, borrow a lot of the information from your own page because it's very robust <laughs> when it comes to some of the economic uh, Q&As because there's so many people in that exact same position. And um, you've been able to provide some guidance on how to apply for a loan and how to file for unemployment yeah. benefits and so forth. So the town website in Pembroke at www.pembroke-ma.gov has its main red banner page now, which is the landing page for all matters emergency management, COVID-19 related, including case counts, um, and then has a, an expanded spin-off to some of the more um, economic, social, um, some of the senior needs, some of the volunteering opportunities, and so forth. So we took a, a page out of your book and tried to expand a little bit on what we were doing over here. That's so thank good. you. I just copied from other good people okay. too. So. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, John, back to you. Sorry about that. But I have a question. What kind of protocols have you put in place for the residents over at the Housing Authority? Well, um, we've, like everybody, tried to stay ahead of it. And so um, we it's very fluid. Beginning on Friday the 13th of March, um, the Housing Authority uh, initiated an effort to reduce the risk for both residents and for the staff. Uh, common areas, the community buildings, vastly restricted. Um, while residents still had access to their mail and to the laundry room for a daily, on a daily basis, um, so too could their visiting nurses and home health aides, et cetera, still come and uh, tend to the, those needs. We've uh, definitely reeled it all in. Um, residents are doing a lot more of sheltering in um, many have adopted their own, uh, maybe every other day going to get their mail or doing their laundry once a week versus every day. Um, but some of the things we've done in, in the offices, we've, uh, begun to platoon our administrative staff, um, allowing and enabling the, uh, workers to work remotely wherever and however possible. Um, trying to limit the contact of face-to-face, -face, whether it's with fellow staff and with the um, population at large. We've also, uh, while the office is closed to the public, we do answer our calls, emails, voice messages, and receive mail daily. And we do, under the circumstances, respond to everybody in a timely manner. Um, we're trying to encourage uh, the most current uh, protocols, maintaining safe, uh, you know, safe distances, encouraging uh, residents to not see their family members. We understand that some of their uh, vital aids and services come from family members. So we understand that they may be bringing them food or they be, may be filling scripts and, and thus needing to come and visit. But the residents have like I said in the in the first uh, question, there was they're very uh, disciplined. They'll come down to a main door, receive whatever it is that uh, someone might be uh, bringing to them, and then they'll return back to their uh, apartment. Um, they're doing a terrific job, but uh, maintenance—that's uh, probably the biggest one. It, we're very vigilant, constantly sanitizing. Um, and cleaning, 
areas. We're only doing emergency work orders at this time. So any routine work orders that we would ordinarily do, um, that has been deferred. Uh, we also will be doing health screening uh, questions upon entry of a unit. Now, while residents or tenants, um, people don't have to disclose, we, we ask general questions to, to ensure safety, both for the employee and for the resident. Oh, that's a really good, uh, good point, and thank you for that. <laughs> Um, to go along with that, Gretchen, a uh, question about how you have been responding to your outreach challenges. You are still delivering Meals on Wheels, and I understand that there's been a bit of an expansion on that for some of the seniors. And to John's point, um, these are folks who know how to um, be responsible and, and wait and be patient. And um, so how is that exchange working out for the COA? doing intake. So if you're a senior and you feel that um, you need meals, um, they all you have to do is call um, the OCES number and they will um, put you on the list. You do need a doctor to sign off on it, but I found that most of the doctors have been very responsive to um, sign, filling out those forms for the seniors. Some who normally get meals three times a week are now getting meals five times a week. And um, some that aren't on the list um, that is an emergency situation, OCES has been very good providing us extra meals. That being said, uh, I went ahead and bought um, shopping bags, um, just the disposable shopping bags. And now all their meals go in a shopping bag and they get either put on a chair outside their door or hung on their doorknob. And um, so they know that once we leave, they can open the door and take it off the, the door handle. The Meals on Wheels drivers all have masks, gloves, and um, we do have sanitizer, although if anyone wants to donate small sanitizers to the COA, we are going through it because they use it every time they go to a resident. Now, did you, you had some conversation with the library director, is that correct? I did. The, the library director and I are trying to figure out a way to do a bookmobile or um, I think we, it was like words on wheels um, to get some books that we currently have um, that she usually uses for the book sales themselves. So what we would do is we're trying to formulate a plan on how to get people to call in or email in, maybe they need a couple of books. And then the van driver for the COA, one day a week will go drop the books, just like the Meals on Wheels, in a bag and stick them on the outside of the door. And these books are books that will not need to be returned to us. They're just books that um, we had extra of, but we want to share because I think people have gone through their libraries. That's a very good point. And honestly, I think at this point, everybody's looking for those kinds of activities. And how are your seniors with technology? Are you finding that there's a new uh, thought to embrace it, a, 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 an expansion of uh, technological offerings for seniors, things that they feel comfortable with? I wish that I could say it was getting better. Uh, some seniors are really good at the technology, but most of the de demographics that we're delivering to are not. Um, it, I've always tried to do an intergenerational program with have the kids from the high school come over and teach how to use your phone so you can, you know, Skype your or FaceTime your grandchild or because right now that's a huge tool to be able to see, um, you know, your grandchildren and to have some daily contact. But I find anyone really over the age of 80 is not too willing to lear learn that test. They just don't want to. Um, so, so that's a little bit tough, but then that's the reason why we are able to reach out verbally. And we actually just sent out, I had a bunch of school um, children um, donate cards. So I think we sent out about a hundred, just randomly, no particular order for the seniors. And um, we sent the, you know, stuck them in the mail so they'll get a card. Um, 
with a little verse on it or a little picture stick figure because they came from all ages, but it was really cute and I was happy to do so. And we'll do some more at the end of this week too, just to give them something to smile about. That's great. Thank you very much. Hey, Erin, question for you about technology among the younger set. How are the parents doing and what kinds of challenges are you running into or are you hearing about? Um, so I think when we transitioned to this um, remote learning platform, we knew there was going to be a couple of technology hiccups. Um, the first one that we had anticipated for was obviously um, access to a device. So over the past three weeks, we've handed out almost 275 Chromebooks to families in need of an additional or a device for their families. Um, this past Friday, we spent about two hours at the high school and gave out over 100 Chromebooks in the pouring rain. Um, so I think that was definitely well received by families. So we're pretty confident that all of our families have access to a device. We have a couple of families that we're working with on access to the internet. Um, so there is obviously, we've talked about them a couple of times, definitely lots of resources out there um, for some free internet service. And we're just getting families hooked up with that. Um, the other piece is just the use of the technology. So a lot of our learning, even in the school day is technology driven. So students have a lot of passwords and a lot of logins and a lot of usernames. So I think just trying to mainstream that as much as possible for families is what our tech department has been working on now. Um, and having teachers, when they're pushing out lessons to students, explicitly embedding the links into some of the lessons so that we're not going out logging in um, and, and families are you know, having to manage that over and over again. Um, when we transitioned to remote learning, we did send out a technology FAQ to families. So I think that helps on the front end with some of the easier problems to solve. Um, but we do have our tech staff working. So if families have questions, um, there is email information available for them so that um, the tech people can help troubleshoot what's going on on their end. As a follow-up, what, what is the expectation for this window of learning at home? I mean, realistically, what is the school department's expectations? Well, we're looking for road scholars. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've asked staff to do, teachers to do, is to, pro is to provide up three hours of academic work a day for students. So the intent is for that work to be independent. So something that they can assign that a second or third grader can do on their own without the help of a family member. Because we do understand that a lot of parents are still trying to work their full work day from home. Um, as far as what is the expectation for handing it in, I think at the, the elementary grade levels, it's really just about engaging and accessing. So seeing that kids are trying some of the, the assignments that are posted, seeing that they're participating in the check-ins with their teachers. I think that's, you know, we're just looking to keep keep them thinking academically. Um, at the secondary level, it's a little bit different. Um, so K to 12, the expectation is that this work between April 6th and May 4th is treated as credit or no credit, um, understanding that any type of engagement would count towards credit. So at the secondary level, I know there are a few teachers that are teaching new material or have um, plans to, to kind of jump into some new material as we get into this. Um, that isn't the focus at the elementary level. It's more about remediation, relearning skills, deepening knowledge of things that they've already learned. At the secondary level, there's a places where it's appropriate to kind of jump into some new content. But the expectation is just that, that kids are engaged and that they're trying. Um, as Cheryl said, our teachers are extremely flexible. And that's you know all we've really asked of people is to be flexible, meet kids and families where they're at, because none of this is going to be perfect and there's gonna be bumps. Um, but we do just wanna keep kids connected. Um, and that has been the focus. Thank you. Josh, I understand this uh, question's come in to you for Julie. Julie, go ahead. Hi, yeah, actually I have quite, quite a few that probably Josh oh. can answer. Oh. Um, the first one is about the COVID-19 um, tracker initiative. And if you could explain what it is, and then there's a gentleman that says he wants to help, he's qualified, he's applied to do it, but he doesn't have a computer at home. Is there any way he can get one to help with this project? Sure. Um, so I got a, there's a, a link on my Facebook page, which I'll be happy to share. Um, and the gentleman was welcome to reach out to me, uh, where you can apply for a job with um, as a tracker, a tracer. Uh, it's through partners, I believe. Um, and because uh, I did have some folks from our district who who'd reached out about trying to get information about uh, that. So they're hiring up to a thousand people to help do this tracking. Uh, I don't know the specifics of it because it's still being unrolled, but it's something that Massachusetts is leading the way on. Uh, Governor Baker and uh, his team did a great job there. And um, I so for the, in terms of the computer, I, I think you would need to have a computer to be able to do that, obviously. I would say, you know, there are a lot of, um, I, I was on uh, 
local radio station, and we had a gentleman call in about uh, talking about his, he didn't have the ability to, to get online. And, and five minutes later, someone called up with a donation to him uh, on WATD. So maybe there's a generous soul who, who out there who can help uh, this individual with the computer. Um, he's, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll just give you my, uh, well, I won't give you my email address, but I'll give you my phone number. It's 781-422-4001. Uh, it's my cell phone. If, you, if this gentleman wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to try to see if we can help him. Um, so that that was that, and was there a second part of the question? Yeah, um, so that's great. I, I will I will suggest that that gentleman does read out, reach out to you directly. Um, you answered a question uh, yesterday uh, on the Plymouth Forum, and it's it's still a, a confusing item for a lot of people, and it has to do with unemployment versus the Paycheck Protection Act. Yeah, let, let me go over that. Yeah, that's could great. you explain um, the so difference? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Uh, no, this is a this is important for folks. So there's a lot of different resources out there, depending on you know whether you're a small business owner, uh, self-employed, what we call a gig economy worker, or maybe just sadly unemployed. Whatever your situation is, there's there's a lot of different assistance both at the state level and at the federal level through what was called what is called the CARES Act. People probably heard that term uh, a few times by now. And the CARES Act included a few different provisions. One of which is called the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. So we have PPE, and now we have PPP. We love our acronyms. The Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program is a great loan program, and I say loan in quotes. It's really a, a, um, a grant program for businesses uh, 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 under 500 under, under 500 employees. So almost every business around here would qualify, and you can get uh, grants for up to two million dollars. Now it's based on your payroll costs. So most small businesses obviously would not get a, a, a grant that large. It's based on a calculation that is um, takes one month of your average payroll cost, including health care premiums, uh, takes that number and multiplies it by 2.5. So 2.5 times your average monthly payroll costs is the amount that you can borrow, again, borrow uh, through the CARES Act through your lender. Now, the great thing about this is that it is a forgivable loan. Um, it's one of the great things about this. There's other great things, including that there's no personal guarantee, there's no collateral needed, there's no origination fees. It is the easiest loan you will ever apply for and get. Um, and uh, the forgiveness part is the is the sort of the icing on the top is that if you agree and can show that you are keeping your wages and your payroll up, in other words, you're not you're keeping you're you're continuing to pay all of your employees over an eight week period of time, you can determine that amount plus. Uh, a portion of your rent and utilities, and that amount, whatever that adds up to, you can knock off your loan, and in effect, you could get it to zero, uh, and not in every case, but in many cases, you could get it to zero, so you would actually not have to pay any of it back. Uh, and then the nice, nice thing about that is that that's not counted as income, a loan forgiveness. Typically, if you get a loan forgiven, that's counted as income on your taxes, and it's not even counted as income in this case. So it's the best, uh, it's a great program if you can get, if you can do it, if you're um, a small business or self-employed or gig economy independent contractor, because you can, if you fit in any of those three buckets, including nonprofits, you can apply for the, the PPP. Now, the question um, that was asked is how that relates to unemployment. Uh, the CARES Act also includes another provision it's also great that uh, extends unemployment eligibility to folks who are self-employed or gig economy 1099 workers. Um, and under uh, the state typical traditional uh, uh, program, you're not eligible if you're, you're self-employed because you're not paying into the unemployment system, but the CARES Act expanded that. So um, number one question I get is, when is that going to be available? Because it's not available yet. And the answer that I have to give, unfortunately, is just be a little patient, uh, it's coming. Um, it required the U.S. Department of Labor to set its frameworks, for lack of a, a better word, and then send them to the states, and the preliminary frameworks were sent, but they're still sort of hashing out the details of us because this is a massive program, and the states are being asked to implement it. And so obviously at the state level, our Department of Unemployment Assistance is working around the clock about this. Um, I can tell you, for instance, during you know times of yore, when we had, uh, before this all happened, we had about, we had about 50 people working in our telehealth uh, send call center, excuse me, our call center, and now there's 500, <laughs> and they're still ramping up. Uh, and, and even with all that, we're still running into folks who you know, aren't able to get through right away. Um, but so um, back to the PPP and the, and the, and the, and the uh, unemployment. So very soon, we expect that if you are self-employed or an independent contractor, you will be able to qualify and apply for benefits. 
Uh, please don't do so yet because you're, you'd just be kind of clogging up the system. As soon as that is live, you can imagine we will all be announcing that to the world and we will make sure everyone knows that. Uh, and, and once you do, you should apply, um, but folks should wait until then. Uh, but for a small business person, then the question becomes, well, if, you, if your employees are laid off um, and then you're not able to get the full forgiveness on the, the PPP loan. So you do have to weigh those things. The goal of the PPP is obviously to keep people employed and we'd all rather keep people employed. So I think that is the, the, the first goal. If that's not possible, then we do have um, you know, the unemployment system, which is um, much more generous than it traditionally is. I should also mention that there's, um, in addition to the, the features I just talked about, there's also an extra $600 a, a week in, in uh, benefits that are being given out bec uh, based on eligibility um, because of this CARES Act. So a lot of benefits there. Uh, I think for a business owner, you have to kind of weigh, you really need to sit down and talk to your accountant a little bit and look at the numbers about um, how much you can get forgiven and how you can strike that balance between trying to make sure your employees stay, uh, stay on the payroll. Um, so it's not a question I can answer totally on a forum, but folks are happy to, if, if they want to reach out to me, I'm happy to try to address it, or you really should probably talk to your, your accountant uh, for those kind of tax level type of questions. Okay, that, that's great. So, so in, in summary, the idea is to keep, <laughs> is to keep businesses open. I could go on. <laughs> no, no, but the idea is to keep businesses open so that when this, yes. this is over, you, you could just open your doors and start again. So you don't lay off your people and you can still pay your rent. You still can pay your utilities. That was the absolutely. whole idea behind the PPP. And, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, and it makes sense. I mean, listen, if you're, if you're an, a small business, you don't want to lose your employees, number one, because you don't, you know, the, the harm that's going to cause them and their families. But number two, you may not get them back. They may find a different job. They may find a better job. Um, so, you know, you really want to keep people on the payroll being paid the best you can uh, during this. And the PPP program is, is frankly the best way to do that. There is also something called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan through the, uh, through the SBA, the Small Business Administration. And that has a nice feature as well. It's, got, it's called an emergency advance. And that has an advance of up to $10,000 that does not need to be paid back. And that, again, is based on the number of employees that you have times $1,000. So in other words, if you had... Um, small business with 10 employees and you applied for this loan, you can get an, this emergency advance. It's supposed to be within three days, although I'm told that's not really happening. I think they're, they're over um, supplied, uh, undersupplied or oversaturated, whatever the right word is there. Um, but you could get, uh, if you had a, a, a business with 10 employees, you could get $10,000 um, that does not need to be paid back. If you had five employees, it'd be $5,000 and so forth. Uh, it's capped at $10,000. That is something that some businesses should look at as well. Um, you can do both, but you can't double dip in the sense that if you do the first one, the $10,000 one, you'd have to deduct that from your PPP. So you can do both. You just can't, can't count. You can't get paid twice, essentially. But the economic injury disaster loan with the emergency advance through the SBA is another great option for folks who are looking for something a little different. And you can also borrow money beyond that with some favorable terms if you really need more capital. So there's a lot out there. I would encourage folks, um, the Pembroke website, my Facebook page or website, We've got a lot of information that we're sharing about, about these uh, different programs. Okay, thank you so much, Josh. There was an, another question um, that I don't know who you want to have um, handle this one, Sabrina, but it was I, the idea of the new um, guidance by the CDC is to, if you're in public, why not wear a mask? <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, is there any um, indication that stores or um, locations that are open will actually require people to wear masks when they come in and maybe they're not social distancing. But at this point in time, that's actually something that, that we started discussing on at the 10 o'clock meeting on uh, every morning. And it uh, really gained some traction yesterday because some of this came out over the weekend. Um, and what we found so far is that you have your first responders now choosing on every call and every run, whether it's medical or not, to wear, um, some form of protection, particularly things like procedural masks. Um, you have all of the drivers, you have the other volunteers wearing masks and gloves. Um, as far as private businesses go, we have heard that uh, they are starting to also uh, try to get coverings, whether they are fabric, handmade uh, facial shields or those scarves that you're seeing with the elastics on the YouTube, quick shared everywhere videos. Um, some kind of personal protection out in public. 
Um, one of the things we did hear that no one was happy to hear was there was uh, potentially the report that an employer had indicated he didn't want the employees to wear masks, and that is not okay. If anyone out there in any profession um, out shopping wants to or feels that they should be covering, they should be covering. I mean, this is at this point, it's a personal choice, but the indication is that we're going to get more guidance on how to roll that out to the public in the next few days to come. And regarding your question of social distancing in stores, uh, for the most part, it's going well. Any reports of, um, you know, large gatherings, uh, a violation of the assembly order of more than 10 people or people not social distancing, those kind of calls are generally going into the non-emergency line at the police department. And um, oftentimes they're just reminding people, just going out and doing some education, you know, driving by, having dialogue from their, you know, distal point and saying, no, you know, break it up, time to go. Mm. Uh, the businesses haven't felt the need at this point to reach back, but um, you know, that certainly could happen. We're just getting started the next two weeks will be a very um, busy time for a lot of these folks. And uh, you'll probably see less commerce and more um, more reporting uh, regarding medical needs and emergency runs. And um, the Thursday forum, for example, will be your first responders again. So every Thursday, you're gonna count on that information, case loads, what's happening at the DPH, how are the chiefs you know, getting their calls in and so forth. Great, that's excellent. I have another question kind of in general, and it's probably best answered by both Gretchen for the seniors and um, by uh, Cheryl Larson for the kids, and it's about screen time. And it's not your computer screen, it's, it's national news. And it seems that you turn on every channel of national news and it's just the dire, the dire and the numbers and everything. So for parents and for anyone out there who wants uh, a little bit of direction is how much of that should be on in your house at any one time? Why don't we start with Gretchen for the seniors? Sure. So that's one of my biggest concerns, honestly. Uh, when I do reach out to the seniors, they're, you know, well, I'm watching this on the news and Sometimes they get some good information and sometimes they get some information that may be a little bit scary to them. And um, some of them say, I'm watching Bonanza. I'm not even watching uh, the news anymore because there is so much on the news that, um, you know, and it's a lot of it's very good information. Uh, so it, it's tough. But, you know, I think just like Cheryl said about the kids and the families, you should, the, my seniors should be setting themselves some boundaries get up at the same time do this you know have your breakfast you know maybe go for a walk if it's nice out you know to get some fresh air uh, but but the news is the news is can be very disturbing um and very stressful for them especially i think over the next couple of weeks and i think we're really going to ramp up and uh we all need to uh figure out what we uh, can do to, to help them in this situation. And even just, you know, picking up the phone and making a call is to them or a senior in your neighborhood or talking to them from the street is just getting them away from that screen time because um, it is, it, it's overwhelming for anyone. Yeah. And, and Cheryl, what do you, what do you recommend for parents as far as how much time they should have CNN or any of those other networks on that constantly have this on all day long? in their house yeah. when their kids are home. Yeah, I think that this is a, a, a very big issue. We're in a time where we're looking for information, we're seeking it out, There's we don't know what's going on. And so we think that tuning into the news is gonna um, make us feel better because the information is going to help with that anxiety. Um, what we're seeing is that we are at an information overload sometimes. And that information for young kids will come into their brain and their processing, and then will kind of carry with them through the day into the nighttime, into bedtime, into their dreams. So I'm really um, uh, encouraging families. They need that information. Figure out a trusted source. It can be your local news. It can be online newspaper. Set a time limit for that and really stick to it because the information is important. But once we cross that line into overload, it affects our anxiety. 
it makes us feel more hopeless and helpless. And um, when we're all kind of isolating from each other, that's kind of the last thing we need to be doing. So I would lean into 30 minutes a day from a trusted source, not having your children exposed to it. Now, if your kids are older, they have their own phones, they're sharing information like that. I think that's where you can start to have a conversation with your teenage kids, your young adult kids about how information overload can impact your mental health. But for young kids, turn it off. <laughs> yeah, that was a really good, really good advice. Thank you. Um, Josh Cutler, I hear that you have some breaking news to tell us. I know, I feel like a, an anchor here, breaking, dun, 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 breaking news. Now, while we were chatting, I just got some, some word in. The state is announcing that um, still we have a CVS that's going to offer uh, essentially drive-through testing on the spot where you get your results on the spot. Uh, it'll be This will be at a CVS in Lowell, so it's not super close to us, but it is being unveiled today. Just getting word right now, and uh, individuals, they expect to be able to test up to 1,000 people a day. Uh, it's by appointment, so you can go to the cvs.com website. And again, it uses this technology called uh, Abbott. I'm not sure. I'm maybe getting the name of the test wrong a little bit there, where they can uh, test and get the results right away rather than the typical 24 to 48 hours. So that uh, is happening at the CVS in Lowell. You go to cvs.com. You can uh, make an appointment there. Um, and hopefully that will be um, something that will be expanded to other locations. But that um, just being announced really moments ago. So I wanted to share that. That's great. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard about that. And Lowell's is, a, uh, I believe it's a company, Lowell Labs, that came up with that. Um, that rapid test. Also, um, another question on volunteerism, and this will probably go to um, Sabrina overall. Anyone in Pembroke who wants to volunteer, whether it's to be a driver for Meals on Wheels, or they want to deliver things, or they want to help the first responders or make masks, is there a central location that people can go to for volunteerism? Is it on the website? It's been loosely structured in on that uh, land. Once you get to the landing page and click on the town logo, it's taking or the town seal, excuse me, it's not a logo, it's a very important seal. Uh, it launches the uh, resource page. So if you were to click on, yes, it will take, take you to the resource page. And there's a fly out from there about volunteer opportunities. And that's going to be something that starts really um, gaining some traction in terms of what can be donated. What kinds of dry goods are we looking for to try to bundle up? I know Gretchen's working very hard over with the seniors to develop what kinds of things they could use to supplement their pantries and how they can uh, not have to get out of the house. Grocery shopping seems to be, uh, you know, one of those places where it's, you know, an, an essential service, but you don't necessarily need your most vulnerable populations at the grocery store. So I'm sure John would be uh, interested in um, being able to share that resource as well. So that page is going to be launched and developed out of that. But any questions can be directed to the Selectman's office um, for redirection to where it needs to go and the information to be disseminated at 293-3844. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, your your uh, website really is great. It's it's kind of one stop shopping. And anything you really need, you can find at the website um, for the town of Pembroke. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, that's all the questions I have that have come in so far. Sabrina, I'll turn it back to you for final comments. Thank you very much. As we go around, I just want to get what kind of advice do you have for the people that you serve? And I wanted to start with Gretchen. What do you want to say to the seniors who I know technologically have tuned in today? So anyone who's tuned in, um, get limit your screen time, ask for help. Don't You find that this generation is a very proud generation. They don't always ask for help, but ask for help. Give us a call. If you need something, we can certainly help. I have a, a lot of volunteers that are raring to go that are, are so willing to help. So, you know, it, and, and if you're not feeling well, the first thing you should do is call your doctor because that's been a, you know, a concern. Um, but you, you just have to, um, ask for help you know that's it every day is going to be changing over the next couple of weeks so every day we have to readjust um, just as you do the seniors out there so the main thing is though is asking for help and sometimes that's really difficult Gretchen what's the phone number they would call it would be 781-294-8220 thank you very much thank right, you John, no worries Thank you for being here. And John, question for you. What kind of advice would you like to give your residents if you could get them all together at once? Well, you know, it, it's, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, Cheryl did about a saturation point, et cetera. Um, you know, 
stay home. If you're not feeling well, you have a sore throat, a cough, fever, fever, aches, chills, or respiratory symptoms, stay in. Uh, wipe down, spray frequently, avoid close contact. As I mentioned earlier, don't invite uh, guests, family members, you appreciate their contact and their concern, but don't encourage anybody to come visiting. Um, do what you've been doing, it's been working, and we can see that um, every day. And uh, avoid close contact, uh, minimize any non-essential trips outside, basic hygiene. Um, stay updated with the town. The town of Pembroke, Pima is doing an incredible job. Police and fire and Gretchen over there at, at COA, it's really serving us well. Um, I don't mean to sound redundant, you know, but I, I will say this, 400 years ago, the Plymouth Colony was established and it was this kind of hardiness and resiliency on display that we see today that got them through that first winter. And we're gonna get through this together. And we all are in it together. Very well said, John. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Obi, Ms. Larson, as we close out for the students and parents, Ms. Obi first. Um, what would you like to see or send out to them as best practice and a good positive last message? Um, I think just reemphasizing, be flexible with your students, patients. Um, our teachers are there to help. If you need anything, reach out. This should not be a stressful, the schoolwork shouldn't be a stressful piece. It's really about, you know, connecting with your family, staying connected with your friends and, and your teachers um, through the platforms that we, we put out. But really being flexible. Um, I think, you know, the mental health piece is, is utmost important and the connection is what we're trying to keep going. Beautiful. Ms. Larson? I agree. Mental health is number one uh, right after your physical health. So I would say get enough sleep, try to eat balanced meals at regular times, drink some water and get some movement, stretching or exercise in some way. Those are your, that's your mental health 101. If you can do those basics, you're already ahead of the game. Thank you, Cheryl, that was great. And Representative Cutler, as you say goodbye to the constituents today in Pembroke uh, on this very upbeat and positive forum, uh, what would you like to say to everybody just to keep them focused and, and, and really um, feeling, you know, um, the best they can about what they're going to see over the next couple of weeks as we go forward. Um, what would you have to say? Oh boy. Uh, well, my message is going to be uh, <laughs> ask, <laughs> simple one. Ask for help. There's a lot of help out there. Ask for help. I wanted to mention quick, three things quick. Uh, one is uh, you can call 211 on your phone if you have a question that you maybe you ever wanted to follow up on. 211 goes to the Massachusetts uh, uh, Command Center and uh, they have operators around 24 7 that can answer COVID related questions or other related questions as well. So try 211. Also, if you want to keep up with the latest uh, on your on your phone, you can get text alerts. If you, if you text COVID MA to 888-777, uh, it's COVID MA to get the latest text alerts. And the final thing was just um, a lot of folks, again, uh, concerned about unemployment. Uh, the Department of Unemployment has a, a town hall, a Zoom town hall, just like this. They do it every morning. You can sign up for it and uh, go through it and, and talk to some friendly folks to walk you through that. So I would just urge folks who have questions about that to take advantage of that uh, resource. Thanks for, thanks for all your great questions and thanks Sabrina for putting together another great show. Thank you very much, Josh, that was great. Julie, uh, we wanna thank you for letting us use this forum. I mean, PAC TV has been very generous. Well, Sabrina, it's really our pleasure. We, we feel so fortunate that um, cable access, local cable, you know, stations can actually be your provider of local news like never before. And we are so grateful that we can do that. Um, and I thank you for that. So t winding up today, every Tuesday and Thursday at nine o'clock, we do have the Pembroke COVID ID uh, forum where you will hear from town officials and a whole bunch of other people and experts in many different fields. We do every day on, on the screen, you'll see it has a record date. Like this says recorded four seven because every single day, things change and um, we never know if the information that we were given yesterday might not be updated. So when you're reviewing these or watching these again, make sure you check the date that it was recorded. You can watch them again by going to pactv.org slash Pembroke and all of the forums will show up right on that page. Uh, we're here again on Thursday. We'd like to thank you all. Stay safe, social distance, be positive and ask for help. <laughs>